Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering EMC World 2015. Brought to you by EMC, Brocade, and VCE. Welcome back, I'm Stu Miniman with Wikibon, joined by my co-host for this segment, Steve Chambers. We're find all of our research at wikibon.com. Uh, always excited when we have practitioners on the program. Uh, Wikibon was founded on allowing IT practitioners to share with their peers. Uh, a returning CUBE uh, alum, yes. uh, Brian Doherty, Chief Data Warehouse Architect with CMA Consulting. Brian, welcome back. Thank you very much, good to be here. Thank you so much. So, we, we've been digging into the database world. I mean, yep. huge changes going on. Uh, you know, can we remove performance overall from the equation so much? The roles of database uh, administrators versus storage administrators, yep. um, you, you know, you've been to EMC World before, you know, what, what, what brings you back? Well, what brings me back is uh, all the new exciting announcements that I, especially two that I heard today, uh, that are very, very good for us, and, and that's along the Extreme I.O. Uh, enhancements, the 20 terabyte to the 40 terabyte brick, and the uh, expansion from the six X brick to the eight X brick. So, uh, performance is, is always critical, uh, what you have to put in to get that performance is really the question. What we're trying to do is to put in less time, but in fact get greater performance. All right, so uh, they announced it as the beast. Uh, the beast. So, so uh, you know, the, really the, the highlight of the keynote this morning, uh, unveiling this. So you've been using Extreme IO. Uh, give us the update on uh, you know what, what's been happening there. Yeah, so Extreme IO from the beginning uh, was always a great performer for us. Uh, the issue was uh, enough capacity, because we support 100 terabyte uh, data warehouses, and we have thousands of users, and we really needed the capacity also. Uh, but Extreme I.O. has gone uh, one step further and taken that 20 terabyte brick to the 40 terabyte brick, which will allow us to get over 200 to 300 terabytes in one Extreme I.O. cluster configuration, which would be great for us. All right, so um, I'm wondering if you could go back and talk to us a little bit about you know, what got you into Extreme I.O., what challenges you were facing before, um, and you know, really the benefits that you've seen uh, moving to this new generation of architecture. The, really one of the first things that drove us to Extreme I.O. was a, a, couple, a couple different things. First of all, reducing the storage footprint. We've always needed you know, 10, 16, 20 gigabytes per second of IO throughput for our large Oracle rack clusters. But we, but we would, in the past, have a four, six, eight bay storage array to get that. That was a costly storage array. So we wanted something that was a much smaller form factor, st still as high performing as we could get on the large storage arrays, and also something we could configure and deploy very, very quickly. So those were the main drivers. Uh, all right, all right, Brian, I'm curious. You know, we, we always often talk um, what, what's underplayed in Flash is the, you know, it's not just the infrastructure, but the facilities costs that go involved, the space, sure. power, and sure. cooling. Sure. Is that something you guys see? Because oftentimes, somebody else owns that bill. It's not something that kind of goes to the IT No, staff, we, we so. host our own data centers. Okay. So at CMA, we also feel that pain. So, you know, power, cooling, floor space, crucial things for us as we try to scale up into the about four petabyte range. Uh, those things are very crucial for us. So we're trying to drive more and more performance, larger databases every day, and continue to reduce that footprint. Okay, so in terms of performance, um, you know, we, we've heard that it changes, it's not just the IOPS, right? Yep. It changes the speed of operations as well. We, we've, yes. we've heard the same as well, that you're a practitioner. Yep. Give us some insight into how it changes your operations. So, in the, in the past, with the traditional storage array, a lot of our performance architects, storage and database, would spend literally days or weeks planning a large layout for, let's say, a 50 terabyte, or 100 terabyte Oracle Rack warehouse. Yeah. When Extreme I.O. came out, now that deployment for us is a matter of five to 10 minutes. So it, it's literally taken days or weeks out of the equation. And it's also reduced the margin of error because traditionally in the past, uh, you have all these different layers that need to be configured from the RAID type to the, uh, to the device setup, to the front end port setup, um, to the virtualization setup. And with Extreme IO, all that complexity is abstracted away from you. Wow. So it's, it's just much easier today. Because well, I know EMC, you know, they're often commented as being very good at marketing, aren't they? And you know, I, I think sometimes something that looks too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. And it sounds like, I mean, we saw a demo this morning, the keynote, yeah. which was fantastic. You know, they brought an 11 year old uh, yeah. kid on stage and did that, but you're saying yeah, it's like that in the real world. Right? 
It really is that simple. Uh, it, 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 what it does is it takes a lot of the complexity that we had to have separate storage administrators and database administrators, and they right. were typically separate. Yep. And now we now with Extreme IO and this simplified storage plane, you can really take database administrators or people that are focused on the performance uh, service level objectives, and they can actually execute the implementation. That's very interesting, and yeah. um, you know we, we've heard that there are plugins available, so. The, you know, the Oracle guy, from his pane of glass, he can see it. So what does yep. that look like? How does that work? Well, the OEM plugin is out there now, so mm -hmm. you can see all of the low-level information on performance. You can see latency on the hours per second, which is important. You can see uh, gigabytes per second that's that's moving through the Extreme IO array. So you get a lot more, you can see, for, for, for example, ASM disk group information. So you can see a lot of uh, performance information through that Oracle window. That but class. surely the DBAs must really miss raising a ticket for the storage guy. They to really send them a do. Report back, they right? really do. <laughs> the DBAs, DBAs love it. <laughs> but what about? Um, it's clear that if something's faster for you to do by yeah. an exponential amount, you know, it's just so quick to do things. You must be able to do a lot more of them and just change the way you interact with databases and storage, right? Sure, what you do is you, you move up the stack. So what right. we do is we, you know, we don't spend as, the infrastructure is solid. When you look at an Oracle database performance, uh, you, the low level infrastructure has to be there. And yep. then you move up the stack and the database and the physical design and the application. Well, we've taken away a lot of the time and effort at that foundation. If that foundation is not good, you're in trouble. Now with Extreme IO, you know that's going to be good, so we refocus higher up the stack. We can focus on the business, we can focus on the physical design, the application, and get away from the layers that we really shouldn't be focusing on. So, so Brian, I'm, I'm curious. Well, Wikidon's done, done a lot of research looking at, you know, even if you spent a little bit more on storage, in the database world, there's huge savings that can be held up and down the stack, even including the licensing. Takes yep. a couple of years to sort out uh, some of those things yep. because it's not something that you know you yep. turn on on demand and everything. H have you done any look backs on, on your standpoint as to what the total cost of ownership is uh, after adopting these technologies? I, I don't, we don't have absolute numbers on that total cost of ownership. What, what we have, though, is we have uh, technology enabling uh, business practices that we that we just couldn't do before Extreme IO. So we're running, for example, we have a, a healthcare, uh, healthcare cost and quality assurance set of heuristics, a rules engine that we run. And that rules engine scans through billions and billions of rows, and it looks for anomalies, and it looks for healthcare anomalies in cost and uh, in quality of care. Uh, that, would take us, that would take us days to run before on a traditional array. Now we can do that in about an hour with Extreme I.O. Wow. So that, that's, that's an example where we're into an enabling technology yeah. that we couldn't even touch. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, that's Extreme transformative IO. to the business, right? That's correct, that's correct. Yeah. So, so, so it allows us to go out and provide kind, kind of a strategic uh, value add to the customers that we service in that healthcare space. So, I mean, do you see new business opportunities because of this? You know, do you see yourself doing something different, apart from when improving existing stuff, right? When we first bought Extreme IO, we, we were looking at that really as a, as a point solution for performance problems, specific right. use cases. Now what we're looking at is putting Extreme IO in as an infrastructure storage layer. So, okay. so where the use case was very specific uh, to Oracle Rack and Oracle Rack on performance, now we're actually looking at Extreme IO for not only Oracle Rack, but other applications, other databases, other analytics, because the some of the enabling technology features here, snapshots, inline dedupe, compression, all of that is really value add to a lot of what so we do. So you're looking at it's becoming the standard. We're to looking to build, you know, take it as a as extension of a point solution and build out a flash infrastructure that we can then capitalize on with other applications. I mean, so a lot, a lot of talk you hear is um, about matching workloads to infrastructure configurations. Now I know from my past history. I just think, oh my God, that sounds complicated, right? Yeah. And you can get it wrong, and humans yeah. are not very good at estimation, and right. all those good things. Right, so, so what this does is it gives us more flexibility not to buy a specific technology or yeah. a specific storage array, and then be boxed in because that storage array can't, isn't flexible enough to scale to a different type sounds of Sounds like a kind of get out of jail free card, just in case someone ever, not, God forbid you it, make the wrong decision. But. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly what, that's a good way to put it. It's really, it's really a risk mitigator. Got you. Uh, you know, when you bring in something that's a small form factor, uh, very good economics, scale out architecture, mm. homogeneous, uh, even performance, mm. great latency, uh, it's really hard to go, go wrong with that. Uh, so it's a great, great risk mitigator. Cool. All right. 
So, so, so Brian, you talked about some of the big announcements that EMC made, but you know, no vendor's perfect. What, yeah. What's on your wish list for the industry in general, or maybe EMC product lines yeah. specifically? I, I think, what would make I think, your job I think there were there were two things on our wish list, and we got we got a couple of them today. Uh, one of them was the increased density on the brick. Mm -hmm. So, so we need petabytes of storage, yeah. and and with the six X brick and the 20, uh, 20 terabyte six cluster, uh, we were having some capacity issues. Yeah. But now we got 80, eight bricks, we've got 40 terabytes. Yeah. So that, that's been answered. The second thing was replication. Replication, all of our data centers are hot, so we really didn't have a great replication uh, solution. We had to handle it through the application. But now recover point uh, mm -hmm. and replication has now come to Extreme IO also. So, so we got two of the things that were really important to us. And I think that's, you know, three years ago when I first started looking at this, we were looking at Flash. Uh, we kind of bet the ranch on the technology and the company, and they have brought to fruition what we were hoping for three years ago. Do you see yourself using different arrays from different vendors? Uh, you must have gone through some comparison, and oh, we went, what was your experience of, of that like? What we, well, what we saw is a lot of vendors that have very specific Flash products and Flash solutions. Mm -hmm. What we wanted was a product that really looked just like any other storage array, but was really all, right. all the okay. performance and benefits of the flash storage. Gotcha. So for example, we use PowerPath as a multipathing layer for the Oracle Rack cluster. We use that for our other arrays, and we like it, it works really well for Oracle Rack clusters. We can use PowerPath with Extreme IO. We couldn't use it with other flash vendors. Gotcha. Uh, so there are just things in the Extreme IO package and configuration that were inherited from the legacy of EMC as a company with, you know, 30 years of storage industry experience that we could exploit and leverage. Can I ask you a question about the kind of operation side? Um, you know, there was a, a day yesterday with EMC talking about DevOps uh -huh. uh, and the impact of, you know, different application styles coming onto the operations guy, and then there's resistance to change and things like that. Yep. Did you experience much resistance from any operations or storage guys? Has it changed their job in any uh, good or some, bad way? Some, some. But you know, as soon as uh, we got them on the technology and using the technology, yeah. uh, it was so easy for them to use. Uh, eventually, that went away. Because I assume they've got more things than they can do in a day, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I know, tell you what so it did is it actually it actually allowed them to get much more done in a day. Yeah. yeah. So to a certain extent, uh, it, it just freed them up to do more work. They uh, was received better by the company internally, and, yeah, and they I, looked good. I, I mean, Brian, I'm, I'm curious. I, I talked to a service provider who went all flash, yeah. and he said, yeah, you know, there's times where I wouldn't necessarily need the performance, but if I can just remove that decision point yep. from what I need to do, yep. boy, it frees me up for a lot yep. of, of I'm other a big believer do. in, we really want that all flash homogeneous array. I really think that's a great thing. Um, you know, the hybrid arrays are, are good. They're good for some people. But you know, there's still some decision points that have to go on in terms of what do I, what application do I put here? What do I put on Flash? What do I put on uh, you know non-Flash? And you know, something really nice about having an all-Flash array, and it's all there. It's simple. Everything's there. It's even performance. Uh, it's just really a, a really nice uh, tool. You know, do you do you see? I mean, clearly you use it for rack. You're running rack yep. in it series size databases as well, which, yes. scared, you know, I've, I always get nervous with data, you know, the fear of losing it, you know, that's just yeah, a... Yeah, it, it's, uh, you, know, it's you know, early on, you know, uh, there were there were some issues with the controller, that was like three years ago. Mm -hmm. We've had it up now running in production, two of them, for uh, over a year, and we've had yep. no issues, no yep. issues at all. Um, so we've been very happy with the performance, uh, very happy with the reliability, very happy with the simplicity. And the other thing I would say that's, that we really wanted, that I didn't mention before, is we really wanted a, a very comprehensive command level interface, and that's something that, that they've delivered in the, in the past couple of releases that have really have allowed us to do things like go in very quickly and cut a snapshot of performance data and then send that into an Excel spreadsheet. Now that sounds like an easy thing, but from a traditional storage array, <laughs> that's not an easy thing to do. Right. It's a high infrastructure, you have to set up the software, the infrastructure, but with Extreme IO, it's all part of the product, the storage management app, and it's it's very very easy to get that data. Well, we've also heard that you know the architecture is different, certainly you know very close to the array. Yeah. What about connecting to it? You know, there's lots of different ways to connect to storage. Does it change anything? Anything that touches it, has it changed that architecture? No, as well? it's it's uh, it very it familiar? really it, it's again getting back to the point. It's very familiar. It's just like operating where there are other traditional storage arrays. Mm -hmm. It's fiber channel zoned in. 
uh, Arbor Channel zoning, power path there. So it really looks just like our old storage array, but performs a lot better. Right. <laughs> All right, well, Brian, we're going to leave it there. Thank okay. you so much for joining. Always love to get your point of view. Sure. If you come on another couple times, we're going to have a whole playlist okay. uh, for the things that we've done. So uh, thanks for, for that segment. Uh, got lots more wall-to-wall -wall action coming here from EMC World 2015. I'm Stu Miniman with Steve Chambers, and we'll be right back after this quick, quick break.